happy lockdown. At least we know God is always good. God is always with us. And even though we can't meet together physically, we can still take part together in time of communion, which we're about to start, and, uh, and hear a word from the Lord through Pastor Janet shortly. We we'll, uh, trust that everybody's well. Keep in touch. Keep in touch with everyone. Keep encouraging each other. Keep building each other up in the Lord. Well, for communion today, I'm going to start reading from a, a passage that uh, should be probably fairly well known, or be very well known, um, in 1 Corinthians 11. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We kind of understand, we have a broad understanding of what proclaim means, but I, I went and had a look at what it meant, what the original Greek word meant there. And it, yeah, it means proclaim, that's fine, but it says, you know, declare openly, proclaim, preach, Lord, as in L-A-U-D, and celebrate um, is where that pro proclamation or that word proclaim has its meaning. Every time we take part in communion, it says here in that passage that Paul wrote, that we, are, we proclaim the Lord's death. We proclaim it. We celebrate, we share, we remember, we do we have all these things, but we're proclaiming the Lord's death. You know, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. Jesus opened the door for us to be in full and complete relationship with God. Jesus opened the way for the Holy Spirit to come and live and reside in us. Jesus paid the price that he he opened that, he presented his blood to let us into the Holy of Holies. That's, um, we can be in that presence of God. You know, the, all these things that Jesus accomplished with his death, um, we celebrate, we remember, but we are proclaiming, as we take these elements, we're proclaiming that Jesus died for us. That all who believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We believe when we take partake this together, we're believing that Jesus died. We know that he paid the price for our sin, didn't just cover it over, didn't uh what it was it was a fulfillment of Passover in that Passover uh the, the angel passed over the place. And in that way, God would pass over the sin, so to speak, of the people by the blood of the Lamb. This, wasn't, this isn't just passing over. This is a complete forgiveness and forgiving of our sins, forgiveness of our sins, and bringing into new life. But we're proclaiming this to others around us, we're proclaiming this to ourselves. We're proclaiming this to, to God that we believe, but we're also proclaiming this to the enemy. This is a stance against the sin and the deceptions of the enemy. But it's a stance to say that we, and a proclamation to say that we are child, children of God that we have been forgiven, that we've been set free by the death of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus. There's two elements that he used in, uh, when, when Jesus was, was taking the First Communion, if you like, the Lord's Supper, Last Supper, um, before he died. One was the broken body, which he represented by bread. And whether you've got Biscuit or bread doesn't matter. It means the same thing. That we are partaking 
of this together, that we have been healed by his stripes, we are healed. His broken flesh, we are healed. And by his broken body, we have newness of life. With the cup, when Jesus poured that, and they drank together of the blood of Christ, the blood that gives us new life, the blood that opens the way to the Holy of Holies, to God's presence. And we take part of that, we take part in that together. And as I said before, we're proclaiming that He died for us. We're making that stand that He died, that He forgave us of our sins, completely washed them away, and we have newness of life. We're new creations. And we're making that proclamation now together. Lord, I thank you that you died for us. I thank you that you forgave us of our sins, that once we know you as our Lord and our Saviour, that once we accept you, Lord, and believe what you have done for us, then we are saved, then we are set free, then we have newness of life. We come together now, Lord, and we take this together and we proclaim with the church and with everybody in the world who believes in you when they take part as well, that we're proclaiming together that you died and you forgave us. You forgave us and you gave us new life. We thank you for your broken body. We thank you for your poured out blood. Bless us, Lord, as we take this together now. In Jesus' name, in your name. Amen. Let's take and eat. Jesus, you are good. Thank you, Jesus. Welcome Welcome to Church 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 Online, Online, everyone. And it's great that you could join in today. You know, it's really a time where we need to press in. And it's a time where we need to realise that even though we cannot get together physically, we are united with Christ and therefore we are together. And it's great to know that God is with us every minute of every day, no matter where we are. And so let's open in prayer today. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you are here with us. I thank you, Lord, that you have given me words to speak. And, Lord, they are words of life. I thank you, Lord, that we are going to have ears that are open to hear what you are saying. And our hearts are going to be responding to what you say today. For, Lord, we are in a difficult situation and time at this, at this moment. But, Lord, I just thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so, Lord, may the words... Be the words that you have spoken, you want spoken, and Lord, you want us to respond to. Amen. So I've titled today, In Christ. Now, as we all know, Pastor Rob said that we were going to be studying this and preaching on this for this term. But my question is, what does it mean in Christ And we find the words in Christ are used by Paul numerous times throughout his epistles. And that suggests to me that they are significant. But what is it that they mean? And what is the significance to you and me today? So let's start our exploration. If we look at Galatians 3, 26 to 28... It gives us insight into the phrase, in Christ. And what is what it means? So the word says, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. 
There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So we're finding here that Paul is speaking to the Christians in Galatia, reminding them of their new identity. since they had placed their faith in Jesus Christ. To be baptised in Christ, into Christ means that they were identified with Christ, having left their old sinful lives and now are fully embracing the new life in Christ. We, like them, choose to change our allegiance. Because we are leaving the old life and kingdom of the earth behind and we're walking through the cross, which is the doorway into the kingdom of God, and walking into all that he, he has for us. But we have got to make that effort of going through the cross so that we are able to receive that which Christ has to offer us. If we look at Mark... Chapter 8, verse 34, and it's very similar in Luke 9, 23. We read, Then he called the crowd to, to him along with his di disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. What are we to do? What is denying ourselves? Well, in re reality, it is dying to self and do what, Christ's are, what Christ asks of us and requires of us. When we hear, believe and respond to the Holy Spirit's drawing, he baptises us into the family of God. And we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For we are, were all baptised by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. There are other scriptures that refer to the believers being in Christ, and these include, as I've put on the bottom of this slide, 1 Peter 4, 5, 14. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Or Philippians 1, 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Or Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or Colossians 3, 3. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. God is perfect ju justice. He can't simply overlook or excuse our sin. That would not be just. Sin had to be paid for. All the wrath God holds towards evil was poured out on his own son. When Jesus took our place on the cross, he suffered the punishment our sin deserved. His last words before he, he died were, it is finished. And we find that in John 19.30. My question is, what was finished? It wasn't merely his earthly life, as he proved three days later that it was not finished in Matthew 28, 7, Mark 16, 6 and 1 Corinthians 15, 6. What he finished on the cross was God's plan to redeem his fallen world. And when Jesus said it is finished, he was stating that he had successfully paid in full for every act of rebellion, past, present and future. 
To be in Christ means we have accepted his sacrifice as payment for our own sin. Our rap sheet, as it were, contains every single sinful thought, attitude or action we have ever committed. And no amount of self-cleansing or self-isolation or or self-effort can make us pure enough to warrant forgiveness and a relationship with our holy God. And that's in Romans 3, 10 to 12. The Bible says that in our natural sinful state, we were enemies of God. Romans 5.10 When we accept his sacrifice on our behalf, he switches, as it were, accounts with us. He exchanges our list of sins for his perfect account that is totally pleasing to God. That's in 2 Corinthians 5.21. There's a divine exchange that takes place at the foot of the cross. Our old sin nature is removed for his perfect one. That's 2 Corinthians 5.17. To enter the presence of the holy God, we must be hidden, covered, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. To be in Christ means that God no longer sees our imperfections. Instead, he sees the righteousness of his own son that is expressed in Ephesians 2.13 and Hebrews 8.12. Only in Christ is our debt of sin cancelled. Our relationship with God is restored and our eternity is secured. And we can read about it in John 3, 16 to 18 and then 20, chapter 20, verse 31. What does it mean that Christ is in us? Many passages of scripture communicate that Jesus Christ lives within those who trust him for salvation. And we read in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in faith, in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. While this is an astonishing truth, it isn't easy to grasp. Not only is Jesus Christ alive today, but through God's Holy Spirit, called the Spirit of Christ in Romans 8, 9, he lives and dwells within every child of God, which means he lives and dwells within each and every one of us. The life of Christ is our hope of eternal glory. And the Apostle Paul called the indwelling of Christ a great mystery. And we read in Colossians 1.27, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul often spoke of Christ taking up residence in the hearts of those who accepted him as Lord and Saviour. When he prayed for the believers in Ephesus, Paul longed for their faith to deepen so that Christ would be at home in their hearts. And we read in Ephesians 3, 16 16 and 17, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. What a powerful scripture. And we could spend a long time just even undoing that scripture and finding the depth that's within. 
But you know, when a person believes in Jesus, he or she is united to Christ. First in his death and then in the newness of his resurrection life. The Apostle Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that is beautiful, isn't it? That's, a, that's scripture in Romans 4, 5. Oh, I just look at them and I think, what, what are we... <laughs> if we can't grasp hold of this, then we really don't know who God is. Our old selves were full of rebellion, sin and unbelief. But they died with Christ who paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. And through our union with Christ in his death, we are made alive by God's spirit to walk in the newness of life because we have been made right with God. In Romans 8.10. Sorry, I have probably slowed down there somewhere. In Romans 8.10. I'll just keep going. In Romans 8.10, our lives become a vehicle to, to display the life of Christ. For God said in 2 Corinthians 4, 6-10, let light shine out of darkness. Made his light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. And that also is what is expressed in Galatians 1, 15 to 16. You know, in our ordinary human condition of weakness, we are but jars of clay holding a priceless treasure. And that priceless treasure is the life of Christ in us. I wonder, can we really grasp what I've just said? The priceless treasure is the life of Christ in us. The challenges we face, the persecution, the trials, the hardships and suffering we endure, serve to pour out the all-surpassing power of God and reveal the life of Christ to those around us. We can rest assured that we will not be overcome in all these afflictions because we have the treasure of Jesus Christ living in us. The power, the authority, the love, the peace, the wisdom, the nature of the fullness of God himself. Oh, I'm so excited that my Father God has made and gifted all of himself to me and he's done exactly the same to you. Wholeness, completeness, nothing lacking. So if this is so, why do we allow fear to come in and rob us of all God has freely given us? Something to reflect on especially in these times when there is so much fear around about a, a virus. But I remember and I stand and I will say to myself, I am made in the image and likeness of my God. Therefore, I have nothing to fear. In 2 Corinthians 2.15, Paul likened the lives of those who share the gospel 
to a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. Or, as in the NIV it says, the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. With Christ in us, as we spread the good news of salvation in Jesus, we diffuse his fragrance to the lost and dying world. As I've said before, I want to be known as an influencer and a spreader of the fragrance of Christ. Some will receive and some will find the fragrance of Christ unpleasant. But my role and your role is to spread the fragrance, to walk in the power, the love and the authority of Christ. It's his job to draw men unto himself. In 1 Corinthians 6.19, Paul again says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. After we receive Jesus as Lord, he becomes our master. And in a booklet that I read a while back called My Heart, Christ's Home by Robert Munger, imaginatively described the Christian life as a house. And he said, Jesus enters. He goes from room to room. In the library of our minds, Christ sorts through the garbage, cleaning out the worthless trash. In the kitchen, he deals with our unhealthy appetites and sinful desires. At the dining room table, He serves us the bread of life to satisfy our hungry souls and pours living water for us to drink and never to be thirsty again. Through the dark hallways and closets, Jesus uncovers all the places where sin wants to hide. He works his way through every nook and cranny until his love Mercy, forgiveness and grace have filled every space. This picture presents a beautiful portrayal of what it is and what it means to have Christ in us. How does God see Christ in me? Well, there are several places in Scripture where it refers to the believers being in Christ. And as you see, I have put some of them down there. Being 1 Peter 5.14, Philippians 1.1, Romans 8.1, Colossians 3.3 gives a little bit more insight. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You know, when we come to Christ as broken sinners, he exchanges our sin for his righteousness. Through repentance and acceptance of God, of Jesus' death on our behalf, we are now called his children. And we find that in John 1.12 and Galatians 3.26. God no longer sees our imperfections, as I said before, because instead he sees the righteousness of his own son. Because we are in Christ, God sees Christ's righteousness covering us. Only in Christ is our sin debt cancelled, our relationship with God restored and our eternity secured. And we find that in John 3.16 to 18 and 20 to 31. In Christ, God now sees us as new creations. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And we find that in 2 Corinthians 5.17. We have peace with God and we are counted as righteous before him. Rather than seeing my sin, God sees the righteousness of his son. He sees me as justified, redeemed, sanctified, even glorified. And we find that in Romans 8, 30. And then if we look at Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, 
We can learn some of the, of the ways God sees us in Christ. In verse 3, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We are equipped with all we need. Did you know that we are chosen to be holy and blameless before God? And that's verse 4. And we can also see that in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Why are we holy and blameless? Because we are in Christ. Ephesians 5. 1 5 tells us that in Christ we have been predestined for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Well, that means, doesn't it, that God sees me as his child? And that's also in John 1 12 to 13. This is to the praise of our God's glorious grace with which he has blessed us. In the beloved. And of course the beloved is Christ. And that's Ephesians 1.6. In Christ, God sees me in love and he lavishes upon me his abundant gifts and the riches of his grace, which is seen in verses 7 and 8 of Ephesians 1. And then God sees me in Christ as an inheritor of heavenly riches, which is Ephesians 1.11. God sees me as his own forever. He has sealed me with the Holy Spirit as, the guarantee, as a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And that's Ephesians 1.13 and 14. God sees me as his handiwork. And we read that in Psalm 13, 139, 13 to 16, and it's in Ephesians 2, 10 as well. He sees me as his friend, James 2, 23. As a chosen one, a holy and beloved, Colossians 3, 12. He sees me as dead to sin, as in Romans 6.11, but raised with Christ. Hallelujah. That's Colossians 3.1. He sees us as a temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16. And as a living stone placed by the master builder. That's 1 Peter 2.5. As part of the chosen people, a royal hope, priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. We are special people. And as one of the foreigners and exiles in his word, and we see that in 1 Peter 2, 11, God sees me as part of his flock. And in Psalm 95, verse 7, he says, he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Why have I laboured this today? One may be asking. The bottom line is we need to truly get deep in our spirit for today and the times ahead that we are truly in Christ and he is in us. To be in Christ is to find personal fulfilment to enjoy brotherly unity and to experience radical transformation. And this is truly the only way we can operate in the world as the salt and light that we are called to be. By sharing the good news we know to be true with others through the love, humility, forgiveness, power, authority, wisdom and peace. We walk in desperate, we walk in this knowledge and understanding despite the rocky roads we are travelling. We are to be influencers and overflow the fragrance of Christ as we pass by or sit and connect with others. We are to show the world there is a better and a different way 
and a better kingdom. A kingdom where we experience the wonderful, fulfilling and unconditional love, forgiveness, acceptance, purpose, grace, mercy and hope-filled life. How do we do this? Well, it's all because of the deeply intimate relationship that is available to us because God first loved us, which is seen through the death and resurrection of Christ. And we, well, all of us, have received this love first and then we go and display his love to others. We need to understand and walk in the fact that it is only in Christ we are able to do all that we do. Apart from Christ, I can do nothing. But in Christ, all things are possible. We need to realise it is a relationship. And I'm going to say a relationship with Christ. He is the only door that can open us all to the fact that we can share in all the promises and truths of God. We need to walk through that door. Otherwise, we're standing just looking. We need to know him and we can get to know him and the mysteries of his character, his nature, his purposes that are hidden in the scriptures and yet available for those who will truly seek. And we need to have the ability to believe that we can come into into full maturity. And when we do, we will be filled with all the fullness of God, as it says in Ephesians. We're all on a journey. We're all at different stages of that journey. But the one goal is full maturity in Christ Jesus so that we can be filled to the fullness of God. And I think this Acts scripture summarises much of what I've said today and it's Acts 17, 28. It is through him that we live and function and have our identity. Just as your own poets have said, our lineage comes from him. And dare I say, from him alone. And I pray that as we take hold of all that he has said to us and everything that we do, that he receives all the glory and the praise. Now, there have been lots of scriptures, but seeing we're in a lockdown, that gives us time to have a look at what the word is saying, because the word is truth. The word is life-giving, and we need it within us so that we can continue to be the light and the salt that we're meant to be. And finally, in Christ is where you and I belong. We belong in the kingdom. We belong to our Father God. We belong to our brother, Jesus Christ. And we have the Holy Spirit residing in us now. Amen. Father, we just thank you that your word is life-giving. And Lord, as we have gone through much today, Lord, I pray that we will realise the significance of being in Christ and Christ also being in us, just as the Father is in God and and God is in the Son. Lord, it's a privileged place, but I thank you, Lord, that your arms are open wide for each and every one of us. I thank you, Lord, that you are wooing each and every one of us into a deeper relationship with you. I thank you, Lord, that our confidence is not in the world but in you. And, Lord, I thank you that you are going to use us 
and you are going to continue to grow us and you are going to continue to use us to spread the good news that God is alive and well. And Lord, I thank you that there's going to be so many more people come as we continue to seek your face, as we continue to live out of your world, out of your world, not this world, as we continue to pray, as we continue to worship, as we continue to share with others and connect with others. Lord, I thank you that this church is going to grow and it is going to need a bigger building. And I thank you, Lord, that that's not very far away. So, Lord, be with us this week. May your shalom peace be ours. In the midst of the storm, we are in Christ, therefore we are safe. And we are whole and we are complete and we lack nothing. So, Lord, bless your people this week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.